Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. All right, we are live. We are back for another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast. And I'm here on the line right now with Mr. Corey Jacobson. Corey, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Bo. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, so uh, how's the weather out in Idaho? <laughs> Smoky right now. <laughs> we're uh, we're into fire season and it's hit with full force. We've got three big forest fires within about oh probably 35 miles of my house one of them's just right over the mountain from us and it's about 30,000 acres so our entire valley here is socked in with smoke from that and it's obviously hot I think we're in the low 90s today which is about as hot as it gets up here and then that coupled with the smoke I'm uh, I'm ready for a cool September morning yeah, I can I can imagine, and I, I've seen that across the West. The uh, wildfires are definitely hitting pretty hard right now. So I, I didn't know if that was affecting your area or not, but we uh, yeah, you know, and it's it's kind of the the area we live in. We we get that each fall, and some some summers are worse than others. But this summer's definitely it's early, and we have a long time to go before we have any hopeful rainstorms. It'll kind of knock them down a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Corey, what I want to do is get into a, a brief introduction of yourself and kind of what you do with Elk 101 and Elk University. And uh, then we can dive right into uh, the main topic of elk hunting. For sure. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, my background's in engineering. And so I think, you know, it's important to mention because uh, hopefully as people listen along, they'll understand some of the the thinking process there, but I realized after about 10 years in engineering that that wasn't the direction I wanted to go as far as employment and lifestyle. So I actually quit engineering and started a construction company. And then during that, uh, launched a website, elk101.com. And it was more focused on just blog style, you know, elk hunting adventure type of a thing. And I quickly realized there were a lot of people with a lot of questions and it turned into, you know, more of a resource for elk hunters, uh, regardless of experience level. So there's, you know, the, the goal is to really create as much information as possible there with articles and videos and, you know, the chat forums and everything. And become a resource that people can go to for whether it's entertainment or education or anything in between uh, that deals with elk hunting. I think the goal was to make sure it's on Elk 101. And about five years ago, it got to the point where I was able to leave construction and have been able to focus on Milk 101 full time for about five years now. Oh, nice. That's um. So with Elk 101, you said it started out as kind of um, a blog and you know some articles there to help new and experienced elk hunters. But it seems like now it's uh, a lot more than than just the the blog and the articles. It is, yeah, you know, and honestly, to its own credit, uh, it just kind of snowballed. And so, as I see demand, you know, if people are asking certain questions or looking for certain information, um, it's really user driven. So it's it's not me sitting here with a plan. It's kind of as requests come up, we try to add that to the site. And so it has kind of taken on a life of its own. And you know, it's uh, it's definitely complex and and very comprehensive. Yeah. No, definitely. And, and in that, you also have an, an online store as well. Yeah. So, you know, several years ago, we just, people would email all the time, what boots should I get? What pack should I get? And so we'd tell them, Here, here's what I use and send them a link to the manufacturer. And we had no sponsors or anything like that. So it was just basically us providing, or me providing uh, my opinion on what I used and what I thought worked. And I, you know, a little light bulb went off and I thought we're sending hundreds of people to buy a pack from here. Why don't we just start selling them? And so we started the online store really just carrying the gear that we used initially. And it's grown now to, you know, several hundred products and 
I would, I don't know, but I guess probably a hundred or more brands that we carry. And yeah, some of it's obscure stuff that most people don't think about, but if it makes sense to carry and somebody might use it, we definitely stock it and ship it. Gotcha. So with with that being said, and the whole Elk 101 platform, in 2016, you launched a, a program called Elk University. And that is something that that I've been a part of from the beginning when, and my listeners have heard me say this before, but 2016 was my first year of heading west and, and going on my first elk hunt. So, you know, I was looking for as much information as possible, but with scattered resources and everything else with the internet has so many good things, but it's hard to, you know, go through the weeds and find out, you know, that, that rows of, you know, information all in one place. And, that was something that I found in the Elk University. So can you go a little bit into explaining what that exactly is? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I can probably <laughs> back up a little. We, uh, we published Extreme Elk Magazine for four years and realized through that that as much as I love the magazine and the content and everything about it, that print just, I mean, it had a shelf life that really – you know, print's never going to completely go away, but I also realized we weren't able to reach the masses the way we could with digital. And so I started looking at options for taking the magazine digital and doing some other things to kind of keep up with the times, I guess. And through that, the idea of an online course, because you know, with everything we're doing at Phil Clinton along, the goal of it is to increase the success of others. And, you know, whether it's through an article, a how-to, a tip, a tactic, uh, the gear, whether it's, you know, anything we're doing, that's ultimately the bottom line is my goal with Elk 101 is to make others more successful. And it just, it, it evolved into this online course with that thought, you know, so taking it from print to digital and then, uh, making it educational based. So I sat down and, and just started writing down every topic I could think of uh, in regards to elk hunting from start to finish. So I've hunted eight of the 10 Western states for elk. So I thought, okay, when I go to a new state, what am I thinking about? How do I scout? How do I plan that hunt? Just started writing down bullet points and ended up with probably 200 or 250 bullet points of different topics and article ideas and different things. And from that, organized it into kind of a chronological journey. So if somebody's never elk hunted before, they could start at the beginning of the University of Elk Hunting and go through the online course from start to finish and really understand everything, you know, every part of the process. So all the way from how do you obtain tags to go and hunt elk, what states offer elk hunting opportunities, what states offer over the counter where you can just show up and buy a tag versus which ones you have to apply for limited draw tags, um, all the way through how to process an elk in the field, how to pack it out. And, you know, ultimately everything in between. And as I started, you know, creating this outline for it, I was able to break it down into about 17 sections. And within each section, there's, I think two to four chapters. So there's a total of, I don't know, 55 or 56 chapters within 17 modules. And honestly, it covers everything I could ever think of or imagine uh, when it comes to elk hunting with the purpose of helping someone else be successful or find success as an elk hunter. Yeah. And the thing that I really liked about it too is it, it's a mix of, you know, writing. It's a, a mix of video and some interactive drawings, pictures. It's a mixture of a bunch of different things to kind of, you know, keep your attention and really show um, how things work. Like some of the, the interactive um, videos you have was showing how the thermals work, which is sometimes a lot, it's a lot easier to show that rather than just talking about it. Um, and I thought that was extremely helpful. You know, and that's the beauty of digital that, that we can't do with print or other other areas. I mean, obviously writing, there's a, there's a, a beauty to writing and there's, there's a component to it where a lot of people can learn really well by reading, but some things just absolutely need, you know, a visual. You, you, know, you can't get hands-on necessarily, but 
being able to take digitally and, and create a video or a motion graphic or something and uh, present that, I think it really captures just the best of, of every aspect, both written, uh, the diagrams and images, as well as the video components. Yeah, and it um, it really broke down, like you said, from the very first thing is, okay, I want to plan an elk hunt, where do I start? And it starts from there and, and goes through, you know, scouting for elk, elk hunting knowledge, um, even down to physical fitness and, and everything else in between, like you said. And it's something that with me having the chapter based um, platform that you can you can go through at different times and complete it, you know, at your leisure. The I, I completed, I think, almost all of it on my through different lunch breaks at work. <laughs> so I get an hour off for lunch and while I'm eating my lunch, you know, I'd put my headphones in at my computer and, and sit there and go and go through, you know, might get through a couple chapters at lunch or whatever it may be. And before you know it, you know, I had all of it done. And as I'm doing that, I'm writing down notes, but as, as it came into the second year of the university of elk hunting, you came out with an app that, uh, that went with it. So it, I didn't need to write down notes anymore and carry, carry those notes into the, the field with me, which was, which was a very big uh, improvement, I would say. Totally. And that was a plan from the start. It just, you know, you have to get the, the content, everything in place, but knowing how many people hunt in areas where you don't have cell service or you don't have a Wi-Fi connection, I definitely want to make sure that that information was available to take in the field. So the app obviously took a lot of work, but uh, the entire online course is available on the app. And, uh, you know, the videos are huge pieces. So you don't want to download all of the videos, but if there are videos, for instance, the video on, you know, the gutless method, how to process an elk in the field or videos on setups or thermals or different things, you can download those within the app. And then, uh, you know, if you're flying on an airplane, you can, go through the course. If you're out in the field, 20 miles from the nearest reception, you can pull up the app and watch the video right there in the field. So it's definitely, it was a plan from the beginning and it was a, a huge relief to get that finished. And, and I think, you know, like what you said, there's a lot of users that uh, I think really appreciate that app just for that reason that they don't always have a, a connection to internet to be able to go through it. And especially, for people who have never hunted before to have that resource at their fingertips in the field, I think is super beneficial. Yeah. And I mean, if you think about it, uh, you, you can watch the video and online of, okay, so when you field dress an elk using the gutless method, you can watch that, but until you do it, I, I know the first time, you know, when I was gutting a white tailed deer, you know, you don't necessarily remember everything the first time. And by being able to reference that video, um, while you're doing it can be a big help, you know, make things go a little bit more efficiently. Absolutely. Yeah. So with that being said, I wanted to start a little bit at the beginning there. So if you were, um, well, you said you hunt, uh, you've hunted eight out of the 10 Western elk states. So you're doing a lot of online scouting, I would imagine to before you go into these places, because it's not, you can't necessarily get boots on the ground, um, to all these places before season and, and in a, you know, an ideal world, that would be great. So could you give me kind of a, a brief overview of what you're doing to, to scout for elk prior to the season? Yeah, honestly, I, I don't know that I've ever been able to put boots on the ground uh, in any area I've hunted until the season, you know, obviously here close to home, I know the area well, uh, but just with, you know, summers are busy. And so having time to go out and scout even locally, let alone in another state is, uh, it's difficult. So my, my process for scouting, you know, we're hunting a new area this year, for instance, and I spend a lot of time on Google earth. So Google earth has become kind of my go-to resource. And you say that and people go to Google Earth and they start looking and, you know, it's just a map of, it might be 3D, but it really doesn't tell you anything about where you're going to find elk. So just a, a few key things that I look for, you know, there's three things that elk need. They need a place of security to bed during the day. They need food, they need water. 
And if you know what you're looking for, you can pull Google Earth up and readily and quickly find those three features. So that's my first thing. When I pull up Google Earth, I'm looking for north-facing slopes where there's thick timber, where they can bed, where it's going to be cooler in September. Uh, Then I'm looking for food, which, you know, food is kind of hit and miss, but for the most part, an open ridge, uh, a grassy meadow, places where they're going to be able to browse. Uh, are going to be food sources. And then the cool thing about Google Earth is you can get different imagery dates. So I can find imagery from September. It might be from three years ago, but I can usually find imagery from August or September, and that'll really show me what water is available there during the time that I'm going to be there hunting. So I find those three key things, and then I start trying to triangulate them and really find them where they're in closer proximity to each other. And... Honestly, if I if I have my unit kind of picked out, I know where I'm going, whether I drew a tag or you know, for some reason I, I picked this specific area, I can open Google Earth and honestly find, you know, really quickly eight or ten areas that match that criteria and kind of eliminate the other, but, you know, the rest of the unit. And then from there, I start looking at access. Is it close to trailhead? Is it next to a road? Is it 20 miles back in? You know, all these different things. And what I'm really looking for is somewhere that's at least a half mile or a mile off of a road, uh, preferably if I have to climb over a ridge to get back into a basin to hunt that area, because that's going to eliminate, you know, 90% of the other hunters right there. But then I also, all of our hunt beans on foot with our, with our packs on our back. So I don't want an area that's going to be 12 miles back in to, to go and check out. So I really just find five or six areas that look good and start plugging that information into, uh, I use OnX, just their hunt membership on my cell phone. And with that app, I just plug in those waypoints and show up hopefully with a day to scout or something, maybe before season, but typically not. Typically we get there and we're hunting from the time we get camp set up and just start going and checking out these areas. And so I would say 95% of my hunting is done uh, through e-scouting or not being able to, to go and actually see the area before we get there and hunt. Yeah. The, when you, you touched on a point there that, that I found that was really important was using the historical imagery, um, on Google earth. And when you go back and, and find a time around September there, a lot of times you can also see where outfitters have base camp set up and, you know, a lot of, and where like trailheads have a lot of trucks at horse trailers and, and things along those lines, which absolutely, yeah, there, there's a ton of information that once you start diving into it and, and kind of have an idea of what to look for, you know, that imagery is, is super powerful. Yeah, that, uh, that, that has been huge. And, and from your online course, that was something that, you know, I, I use on X, um, the hunt app as well. And I, I'll do it from my computer, go on and, and start marking those areas and just putting waypoints there. So then once you go out into the field, you have them. And like you said, you can and check those areas um, and, and see if, uh, if your online scouting was true, if not, you know, kind of moving on to the next, next area. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And just a, a warning for anybody who's not used Google earth and then actually went to an area Google Earth is a little deceptive. It's it's going to be a lot steeper and a lot more rugged than what Google Earth makes it look. And that's, <laughs> you know, every year I get on and I look, I'm like, oh, that's not too bad. It's a thousand vertical feet. We can probably hike that in an hour. And then you get there and realize it's it's a thousand vertical feet, like almost straight straight up. And that is one thing to keep in mind as you're on Google Earth that if it looks steep, it's going to be really steep. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, the biggest wake up call for me when I, because the first time I went elk hunting was the first time I've ever, you know, saw the Rocky Mountains. And I, I get out there to the trailhead and all these places that we plan on going, all right, you know, day one we'll hit here and then we'll, we'll move on to here. And I'm like, that's going to take me two days to get to that spotter <laughs> and add elevation into the mix. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot more difficult than it sees and, uh, than it, uh, shows and Google earth is, can be very deceptive. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. But anyways, uh, kind of moving on from, from scouting for elk, um, I, I think a lot of times, and, and again, this is my assumption based off of what, 
what I kind of did going into the first year was I, I did a lot of scouting and was able to find elk in those locations. And I worked on my physical fitness, which I think that was a, a huge part of, you know, helping me out there. But the one thing where one area I really lacked on was actual elk hunting knowledge. So what to do when you, you know, get in close to, to an elk, you know what I mean? And, um, from a locating totally. standpoint to actually killing them is a whole nother, another story. You know what I mean? And <laughs> I, I learned that very, very quick. <laughs> totally. No, and, and honestly, that's, for me, that's the thrill of elk hunting is that the strategy that comes from once you locate them to be able to, to get set up and get a shot. And it's unlike any other hunting I've done. I mean, especially if you start talking about calling and, and getting into that, but then that becomes a whole nother area that can be really intimidating you know just planning the hunt scouting all of that is is tough enough but then you show up and actually have to implement a strategy and follow it and that's a lifetime of experience there so just you know i mean even stepping back before we get into you know actual elk hunting knowledge is just elk knowledge and you know the habits of elk and what they're doing and how they're using the landscape how they're using the thermals and you know, how they move and timing of when they go to bed and how long they stay in their bedding areas. And all of these things are, are so important to understand because once you understand that, then you can actually implement a strategy based on, you know, a pretty solid understanding of what the elk are going to be doing and have a much better chance of actually not only locating them, but then using your strategy, whatever it might be. Um, but then, yeah, then once we get into locating them, and, and like you said, you located elk right away, that's a huge part of being successful and, and being able to enjoy the hunt. I hear stories from people that go hunting and they spend eight days and they don't see a track. They don't hear a bugle. They don't see an elk. And I, I don't have the patience for that myself. And I feel sorry for those who invest so much time and energy and finances to go and do it. And then to, to just not be able to enjoy the full experience. And uh, so, so locating elk is important, but then, like you said, from there, the knowledge of what to do and, and how to implement it, I think is probably the, the real key to being successful. Yeah. So that it was, it was funny. The first day that we hiked up in, um, once we drove 27 hours straight to get out to Colorado and, uh, <laughs> hiked, <laughs> hiked, started hiking up in from the trailhead. And, um, the, the first thing was the, the, main trailhead that uh, we pulled into there was about I, I can't remember 20 25 vehicles there and I, my heart you know instantly sank and what then once I realized that you know 90 percent of them were Subarus um, <laughs> you know I was all right is a popular area for um, you know sightseeing and as the aspens start to change and everything but uh so then we went up to the secondary trailhead that was kind of up a four-wheel drive only road which just to let anybody know um if you're you know what what you think of a four-wheel drive only road in uh in the east is a lot different in the west so uh make sure that you do have a vehicle capable and the driving skills to be able to sometimes go up these roads. And I actually had called the, the forest service ahead of time to make sure the roads were open and in good condition. Cause otherwise that can, that can change up your plans a little bit if you can't uh, get into where you're, where you're going to. But that was a, Definitely. Anything a big goes thing. Back to, you know, having resources for your scouting, you know, just being able to know the national forest and be able to, keep up to date on some of those road closures and you know here in idaho we've got a, a website it's trails.idaho.gov and we can go there and see you know the dates because some of our roads and trails close on certain dates some of them right in the middle of elk season so you can show up on the 14th of september and be all excited and drive up into this road and then find out that on the next day they gate it and lock it there's no motorized access in there and so you know, some of those resources to kind of check into ahead of time are important as well yeah so when we hiked up in um we got up to the top of this ridge and there was an area i had marked um bedding area down in this steep canyon and one i was trying to figure out how i would even get into the canyon but uh let off a, a bugle from this this uh one location and it looked like a picture perfect you know spot to 
throw a bugle down in this canyon and uh <clears throat> excuse me that we we didn't hear anything and uh sat there for about a minute and all of a sudden a bull lit off right down on that north facing slope as it was just about to get dark he lit off a bugle and that was like you know first night in there here in our first bugle you know and going elk hunting from you know driving 1400 miles to to do that was unbelievable it just was a great feeling but then you know what, what do you do from there why was that bull you know in that location and everything and what i'd like to get into a little bit and and you started touching on there was elk knowledge and kind of how they're using the the wind and thermals to their advantage which is something that uh well fr- coming from the appalachian region we deal with a lot of thermals with whitetail hunting and some of the, the steep terrain, but it's a, I would say it's still a lot different in the West. It can be, but I think, you know, and, and you probably have a benefit coming from, you know, a mountainous area because mountain thermals are different than you know, what, what a lot of people are used to when they think of wind and thermals when it comes to whitetail hunting, you know, and you place your stand or, you know, your, the way you approach and different funnels and everything when you're whitetail hunting are important. But when you get to the mountains, you know, the, the thermals dictate all of the movements the elk are making. So the areas that they use to feed in the bed and during the night are usually in a bit lower elevations in, a, in an area where the thermals are funneling down because the nighttime thermals are coming down when it's cooler. And they're going to be able to smell any danger that's around them in the mountains above them. So if they were at the top of the mountain, we could, you know, walk right up to an elk basically. And as long as it couldn't see us and couldn't hear us, we could walk right up to it and touch it. And they know that. And since they spend every day of their life trying to survive from predators and other harsh elements, they, they're pretty aware of what the thermals are doing and they use them to their advantage. And then, you know, as they're moving to their bedding area mid morning or early morning, they're moving with the thermals in their face so they can smell any danger ahead of them so they don't walk into into a dangerous situation. And again, the thermals are coming down at that time. And then once you get to their bedding area, which is usually a little higher on the mountain, on a bench or somewhere, the thermals change right about then and it brings any scent up the mountain from behind them. And so just that understanding the elk location, where they're spending the night, where they are at different times, you can almost start to pick it apart and say, well, if the thermals are coming down, they're going to be, you know, here are the four pockets. They're probably going to be feeding in during the night. And if the thermals are, you know, still coming down at 9 a.m. and then they switch at 10 a.m., this is probably going to be a ridge that they might use to travel from there. And here's a really nice bench where they're going to be protected by the thermals. And just that that simple understanding, I, I stress all the time the importance of wind. And when you're elk hunting, every move you make, every time you you move to approach an elk, to set up on an elk, to call the elk in, you know, it's all dictated around the wind and understanding what the thermals are doing, not only right then, but what they're going to be doing in 10 minutes, in 30 minutes, in an hour, whatever it might be. Yeah. So, um, and and you're saying, so as the, you know, the thermals are still coming down in the night, like, is it starting to get morning? Let's, let's start from the beginning of the day here. And as they're going back up to, to bedding, do you have any luck with making a move on them, you know, at that first light? Um, or is that something that's typically, you know, tough when they have an agenda of heading back to bed? Definitely. No, that's a, a great question. I think so many hunters look at that first light and last light is the prime time to hunt. And it's definitely the time where elk are very active. Um, you're going to see them typically on the move or as they get to their feeding area. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's probably the time when there's the most interaction. And I think people sometimes look at that as, Hey, that's my best chance. But like you mentioned, the first thing in the morning, elk are, they're in the low country, they're in their, their feeding areas, they're grabbing a bite to eat. There's probably water close by, they're getting a drink. And then as they realize, Hey, it's getting close to when the thermals are going to change, we need to head to our bedding area and start moving up the mountain. So they're traveling on a ridge or something moving up in elevation with the thermal still coming down so they can you know, be aware of any danger. And as they're moving up, you know, if you're trying to follow them, they've got a pretty good agenda. They've got to get to their bedding area before that wind changes. Otherwise they're going to be caught uh, kind of unprotected as they move up the mountain. If the thermals are moving up and they're moving up, they could walk right into 
danger and not know it. So they're definitely conscientious of that and somewhat in a hurry to get there. Uh, they at least have a, a window there where they know they need to be there by. So if you're following a herd of elk up the mountain and trying to get this bull to turn and leave his cows who are on a mission to get to their bedding area, it can be, it can be pretty difficult. And you hear people talk all the time, well, the bull just bugled and ran, bugled and ran. He couldn't be called in. He was call shy or he's a big herd bull and wouldn't come in. Well, realistically, he was probably just going somewhere and, and couldn't take the risk of coming in, whether it's because he felt unprotected as he came into the call setup or whether he was with the cows and knew that if he turned and came in, the cows are going to keep going there and wait for him and he could get separated from them and another bull could come in and steal them. Whatever it is, there's there's a reason because at the heart of calling, elk want to come to calls. I mean, that's that's natural for them to do. And so if you're chasing them up the mountain and they aren't turning, it's probably because they're just wanting to get their bedding area. And so if we're not having success getting them to come into calls, following them up the mountain, we'll just get over on a parallel ridge from them and kind of shadow them as they go up, keeping them talking, keeping tabs on where they are. And then once they get to their bedding area, we'll let them kind of settle down for a bit and relax and then go in and, and do our setup and our calling. Okay. So last, last, uh, September I had that situation where I had a bull bugling. He was actually, he was just chuckling, just kept doing that. And he was definitely with cows and he was moving up to the bedding area. And I tried chasing them like, <laughs> like you described, you know, he's bugling away from me. <laughs> like we all do. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, and I, I did actually, I caught up to the, to the group. Um, but it was in such thick, dark timber. I, I got about, I think it was 22 yards is what, how close I was. It was exactly 22 yards. And, uh, I, I couldn't get a shot with how thick he was, but he was just pushing the cows up the hill and wanted nothing to do with it. But I'll tell you what, even to get to that point of catching up to him, it took me two days of trying to, <laughs> to, to actually catch up. And even then, you know, I, he couldn't get a, couldn't get a, a shot opportunity at them. And, um, and at that point, then, then I ended up, uh, I don't know if one of the cows saw me or if he did, but he shut up at that point. And when they do go up to, to bedding, and I've heard you say this a lot that you like hunting that midday when they're in their, their bedroom, how, I mean, you kind of touched on a little bit saying that you kind of listen to, you know, where they're bugling, where they, you know, bed down. But if you don't have that knowledge or don't know where they exactly bedded, if you have like a section of dark timber on north facing slope, how would you approach that? So yeah, midday is, is probably the most effective time to call in an elk. And a lot of it has to do for the reasons that we touched on just with them being on the move first thing in the morning, they're following cows. They don't want to get separated. Um, but if you can get up there to where they're bedding, you know, on the north face, and if you know where they are, it's it's ideal you can move in then and set up. But if you don't know exactly where they are, and that's honestly a lot of our strategy is, you know, midday, the thermals are coming up, so you don't want to be below them. If you're in the in the creek bottoms, walking up the bottom of the creek bugling, you know, you, you just, they're going to smell you. And that's why they're bedded up higher is to alert them of danger. So we always like to get up on big ridges and basically cover as much country as we can. And we'll cover... 10 to 12, you know, up to 15 miles in a day, just on a ridge. And all we're trying to do is get a, a response from the elk. And they're not nearly as vocal uh, during the middle of the day. But what I found is if you get on a, on a ridge overlooking a big north face and there's a bench down there and there's a, a bull or a herd of elk bedded on that bench, it might take them hearing your bugle two or three times before they answer but for the most part, they're going to they're going to respond, and it might you know they aren't probably going to be fired up. They aren't looking to come in and fight. You aren't going to be able to call them up to you. But again, all we're trying to do at that point is just locate them. So we're covering a ton of country, bugling down into basins that have north facing slopes, and just looking for a response. And then once we get the response, we can kind of pinpoint exactly where it was, and move in close and get set up, and then go through our calling sequence and strategy then but that and realistically that's probably my number one tactic for locating elk is just on our feet covering a lot of country looking for a bull that will bugle during the middle of the day and if i can find a bull that will respond at any degree you know it doesn't have to be fired up if i can just get in and make a noise during the middle of the day 
I think my chances of being successful on that particular bowl are so much higher than just about any other situation. Okay, so when you when you do locate um, a bull down below you there, how, what is your what is your next step to approach to approach that elk and and you know get in position to actually you know actually be hunting them? Because at that point, like you said, you're just locating them, but you're not going to be able to call them up over the mountain to you for for no reason. Right. Yeah. So I mean, that's really where the the hunt starts is right then. You've located the elk and. You know, again, you have to kind of think like an elk. An elk is, he's in his safe zone. He's there probably with his cows. Um, he doesn't want company. He doesn't want competition. He's somewhat protective because this is his area. He doesn't want another elk coming in there and messing around with his cows or anything. So if you can understand kind of the mindset they're in, they're comfortable there. He responded to let you know he's down there. But at that point, you haven't engaged in any kind of confrontation or anything. So our next move is we just go as quietly as we can and get as close to that bull as we can. And we don't want him knowing we're coming. Even if even if he perceives that we're another elk moving into him, that might be enough for him to get up and just move off because he doesn't want the company. Um, so we want that element of surprise. We want to move in as close as we can. And when I say as close as we can, it really just depends on terrain, but ideally you know, 120 to 160 yards, you know, would be ideal. If you can get a little closer, great. Sometimes 250, 300 yards is as close as we can get because there's a big open meadow or, you know, thick brushy hillside that they're going to hear us coming through, but just as close as we can push. And then maybe another 10 or 20 yards closer, uh, feeling comfortable, we're, we're going to get there. And that's really, I, I call it just the approach. And once we get the approach, getting close, the setup's really the key piece. And you just want to find an area that that bull's going to be comfortable coming into. Again, thinking about what he's thinking. He doesn't know there's an elk there. We're going to light him up and, and let him know not only is there an elk really close, but it's an aggressive elk that is there to challenge him. And we just want to make sure when he gets up and decides to come in that he's going to be comfortable coming in. He's got a good trail where he feels protected. The thermals he thinks are in his favor. And again, there's some deception to it. You know, we want him to think that he's coming over a rise to look down at where this elk's calling to him from, from a safe distance. And that's where having a shooter out in front of a collar becomes important. Um, he's probably going to circle on the downwind side, whether it's uphill or downhill, whichever way the thermals are going, but he's probably going to circle that way so that he can smell if there's any danger. So again, as we're setting up, we want to make sure that we're taking that into consideration so he doesn't go above us as the wind's going up and smell us before he gets to shooting lane and all of these things that, you know, are so important to maximize our efficiency and, and opportunity for success. And I, going back, I guess the main point is we just want to get as close to that bull as we can quietly without him knowing that we're coming. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, um, w when you get into that distance, you said you're calling or, and you're, and you're bugling, but is there like a certain tone to your bugle that you want, or is it more of a locating bugle again? What, what are you trying to exactly do there? Yeah. You know, and the calling, you know, before I got into the, the sequence that we use and everything, I just wanted to stress a couple things. Number one, I don't think there's anything more exciting than calling to an elk and, you know, just the sound that they make, the, thought that you're calling to an 800 pound animal with a great big set of antlers on his head and convincing him or another elk and here he comes charging in either because he wants to breed or he wants to fight um it calling for me is is what makes elk hunting what it is and i think you know for, especially for someone coming from back east or from somewhere where there aren't elk or that they can't hunt elk you know it seems kind of like that dream and i think that the the picture that everybody sees in their mind is this majestic elk out in the meadow and there's frost and, you know, he lets out this scream of a bugle and steam comes out of his nose. And I mean, that's, that's the picture of September and, and calling elk. And that's honestly the scene that I see over and over in my dreams every night is I can't wait for that again in September. And then, you know, the other thing is calling can be intimidating and the sequence that I use for calling and the strategy that I use for calling is super simple. And the reality is elk are simple animals. I think we overcomplicate hunting sometimes to a point where we start injecting our own thoughts and 
you know, our own strategies into it. But when you break it down, if an elk or really any animal is responding to calls, there's a reason for it. And if we understand the reasons why they're calling, it becomes really easy to fit our calling strategy into those reasons. And for an elk, I mean, there's really only two things that are going to make a, a bull elk come into calls. Either you've convinced him you're a cow and he wants a cow at that point for breeding, or you've convinced him you're another bull and he wants to come and fight you either to establish dominance or to get you out of his area or to steal your cows or whatever it might be. So my whole calling sequence is based around either trying to convince that bull that I'm a cow that needs bread or I'm another bull that wants to fight. And, you know, I don't worry about um, necessarily the sounds or the language that they're, that they're speaking. Those are really emotion based uh, strategies. So I put emotion into my call and it's something that, you know, I kind of have to become an elk. You just have to put yourself into that elk skin and say, if I was another elk and I wanted to get this elk in my face to fight right now, not what would I say, but how would I say it? And you just put that aggression into it. Let him know that you aren't happy with him and you want to fight. And so our sequence is simple. If, if there's a caller and a shooter, the caller's back behind 50 or 60 yards, the shooter's set out out in front and the caller has the responsibility just to bring that bull into the shooting lane. And we start off with just a cow call or two, just simple cow calls. And again, we've moved in, we're close to this elk, 120, 150 yards away. He doesn't know we're there. We let out this cow call. Typically you're going to get a response from a bull during the rut. And again, we aren't concerned about what he's saying. I'm not concerned about how excited he is or anything. I might let out a cow call and I can tell he just instantly hammers and screams and says, I'm interested in a cow. And maybe he gets up and walks all the way in from that one or two cow calls. But for the most part, what I found is cow calls, if they come in, they're going to be a little more cautious. They're going to expect that cow to come to them because the cow is there. It's the, you know, the rut, the cows are ready to be bred. Typically if a bull bugles, he can get a cow to come to him. So what I found is, Cow calling is effective to get him to talk, but it's not always the most effective way to get him to come into a setup. But what I have found is if you can challenge that bull. So again, we've cow called. He thinks there's a cow there. He thinks the cow's by herself and he bugles and basically invites the cow to, to come to him. And we just hammer him immediately with a challenge bugle. And that challenge bugle is, it takes him by surprise. He doesn't know there's a bull there. He's just talked to this cow that he thinks is alone, and now this bull is there, and he's challenging him and basically saying, you know, don't talk to my cow. Come up here and fight me. And you've got to put that emotion into it. That You've got to be mad at that bull for talking to your cow. You've got to scream at him and tell him it's not okay and that you're issuing a challenge to come and fight. And it's, it's an incredibly effective strategy, and it's incredibly simple. And so we just do the same thing over and over. If he doesn't come in that first time, we cow call again a couple times. Maybe we'll wait 30 seconds, cow call again until he responds. And once he responds, we immediately hammer him with another challenge bugle and just found that, you know, repeating that process anywhere from one to 10 or 15 times usually is enough to trip that trigger and, and elicit that emotion in him that, okay, I'm going to go in and fight. He's challenged me and, He's in my home turf. I'm going to go in and protect it and protect my cows, and I'm going to go in there and run him off. So when you're when you're doing that, um, if say he's not coming in, but he's answering your calls, are at that point are you trying to move closer and really get inside his comfort zone, inside his you know bedroom, and really push his buttons more, or what? What's kind of your strategy there? You know, there's a, there's a couple things. The first thing that I'll try. Uh, if calling isn't immediately breaking them loose, I'll rake a tree. And so elk show their dominance. They display their dominance by taking their antlers and basically just thrashing pine trees, you know, whether it's a sapling or just some dead branches there, but they really just start thrashing it, trying to make a, a bit of a ruckus. And so I'll just pick up a stick and simulate that, you know, I'll thrash a tree and break off a, br a bunch of dead limbs off of it, or, you know, rip the bark off of a sapling and uh, simulate that to display dominance. And sometimes that's enough. You know, we've, we've challenged them. Now we're threatening their dominance. Sometimes that's what it takes to, to break them loose and get them to come in. Uh, if they still don't come in, there's probably something holding them up. And whether it's 
you know, they can see where the calls are coming from and they aren't convinced there's an elk there or they're downhill and they don't want to come uphill to the call because of a, a physical disadvantage or they've got cows that are up milling around. They don't want to take a chance of leaving them. There's typically a reason why they aren't coming in. And so we try to you know, understand what that is. Is it because he doesn't feel safe coming into the setup? Is he, are we just not close enough to pose a, a real threat? And so at that point, if we, you know, if we're 300 yards off, we'll probably say, yeah, we've got to get closer and put some pressure on him. But rarely have I gotten in close on an elk and put real pressure on him where they haven't come in. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a reaction that they respond to. They come in to either fight you or to chase you away. And again, if they're bedded down, the cows aren't moving. They really have no reason to run. And every once in a while, you know, if you're in a heavily pressured area where there's a lot of other hunters, they might, you know, recognize that, hey, there's a lot of danger in this area. I'm not taking a chance. And they'll get their cows and round them up and move out. So it's kind of just understanding, you know, maybe a little more at that point of what's going on, what might be keeping them from coming in, and then adjusting whether that's moving in closer. Uh, whether that's you know, trying some other tactics that you can add to that calling sequence, uh, but just that understanding of hey, it's not working. We've got to we've got to change it up. And honestly, I'm a very impatient person and very aggressive when it comes to hunting. So if after four or five minutes we're just in that stalemate and kind of locked down there, I'm usually trying a, another tactic and working it from another angle. Okay. So like, I mean, the main thing that, you know, I'm taking out of that and, and also, you know, I'm, I've definitely identified a bunch of mistakes I've made and, uh, kind of been able to, to see where the, those problems were at, but, um, is really just putting emotion into it and trying to obviously be that, the other bull and, and elk that's there to try to, to, you know, trick them, um, essentially to, to come up and, and into your, into your lap when well, I, I can think of two, my one mistake that I didn't pick up on from, from listening to you and some other people in the past, when you were talking about going through those bedding areas midday, I wasn't running the complete ridge tops and I was kind of going through the middle of it, running the benches. And that screwed me a couple times with, you know, bumping elk out of their beds and everything else. So uh, again, what I'm picking up is, you're being aggressive, but you're still not being reckless with it either. And, and that's definitely something that, that I think, uh, that I'm going to take as a, as a big note out of this. Totally. And, and when I say aggressive, it's not a reckless aggression. You know, we're definitely calculated the thermals are doing, how we approach it. Um, the aggression comes from pushing the envelope in. And I think, you know, it's so hard because calling can be difficult, learning all these different calls. Uh, it really takes away from the confidence people might have in their ability to call. And if you aren't confident, you're definitely not going to be as aggressive. And so a simplified approach, uh, you only have to basically know a, call, a challenge bugle and location bugle. And I, I feel that that's going to work in 90% of the situations you're in uh, during the rut. And so that gives people confidence. If all they have to do is master three different sounds, that's not overwhelming you know it's, it's still not easy to learn but it can be done with a little bit of practice and so it gives confidence that confidence i think gives you the the ability to be aggressive and yeah you'd mentioned you, know, you get on maybe the same level and kind of side hill and google a couple advantages to being a higher first off if the elk happen to be 100 yards above you and you know you walk right in within 100 yards of them and let out a bugle it's really easy for them to take 20 steps and get above you and smell you and realize there's danger. Uh, so being on the actual ridge top, elk usually aren't going to bed right on an open ridge. So you don't run that risk of them winding you. The other thing is when you bugle from a ridge top, you're able to touch pretty much every corner of the basin on both sides of that ridge. Whereas if you're mid mountain, sometimes you can't even hear, you know, a response from an elk. that's just around a little finger ridge from you on the same elevation. So it just gives you a better opportunity to broadcast those calls out there and maybe reach a lot bigger landscape than what you can do mid mountain. Yeah. And, and from the area I was hunting in last year, I was up around 11,000 feet. And so like, uh, I guess, would you say that you would run kind of tree line at that point since the ridge is a lot higher up from there? 
you know, that's a great point. Um, all of my strategy is in a timbered area. When you get to Colorado where you're hunting 11, 12,000 feet and you have timber line, sometimes elk habits actually reverse and they actually bed lower than where they feed. So they'll go up above timber line to feed during the night. And then contrary to thermals, they'll actually drop down uh, into a, a bedding area and go kind of against the grain of everything we've talked about so far. But um, <laughs> yeah, you just, if, if you're hunting those bedding areas, you want to be above them for the reason of thermals. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's always better to be above and then drop down when the thermals are coming up. If you're mid-mountain and, and an elk answers from above you, you're really either scrambling to get up on the same level or above them, or it's too late and they've smelled you. So, you know, it might not be the actual ridge top, but for the most part, elk are going to bed in the timber where it's where they've got some shade and it's a little bit cooler, especially if it's warmer during September. Yeah. So, yeah, getting up above that timber line or right at timber line even and, and kind of approaching it from that angle. Yeah, and that's it's funny you say that because uh, that's that's what I was thinking. I'm like, it doesn't make sense because a couple of the mornings I decided to sit up on this cliff edge and watch the high country through the glass. And there, as it got light, there was elk up in the high country and they dropped down into the timber. And I'm like, this isn't making sense, you know, from a <laughs> from a thermal standpoint. And I was just. Yeah. And again, I was kind of lost with, with figuring out at that point, but once they get in their beds they're the thermals aren't going to, they're going to still be doing coming uphill once the sun warms up the mountain there. And so running right above that tree line would be your best bet. Yeah. And honestly, they're probably not bedding too far down into the timber. Uh, so they can still use their eyes and see if there's any danger at bottom. They can smell anything that's coming below them and then they can you know, either look up on an open hillside and see if there's danger approaching, or maybe they head underneath a big shale slide or a really thick brush area where they're going to be able to hear anything trying to approach them from above. So they really, I mean, when they bed down, they're pretty much protected from every angle by one of their senses. Okay. All right. Yeah, that, that uh, definitely makes sense. So when you're setting up on the elk, going back to that a little bit, um, you talked about if you have two people with you, but what if you're by yourself? How would you change your your calling strategy? You know, it's really the same. You've got to elicit the same, you know, response from the elk. The thing that you don't have, you know, if there's two people, if you have a caller and a shooter, the benefit is the elk's attention is on the caller. And so the shooter's out there. He's He's a silent killer. You know, he's out there and, and that elk's coming by not even realizing there's anything there that, poses a threat and when you hunt by yourself you have to become the caller and the shooter so you have to convince that elk that either the sounds are coming farther behind you and make that elk you know go and look for that sound past where you really are so you're becoming kind of a ventriloquist you're throwing the sounds behind you uh but the key to it is is the setup and making sure you're set up in a place where that bull really has to come all the way to the sound before you can get a, a visual. If you're set up 100 yards across an open hillside and you're behind the last tree there and that bull comes to the, the edge of the other side of the opening and looks down there and can tell exactly where that sound's coming from and doesn't see an elk, he's not coming any closer. And so as a, as a solo hunter trying to call, your setups have to be a lot more precise. You have to be set up so that that elk is going to come all the way in before he gets nervous. And then if you can cast the sounds, so here's the muffled cow sound with your head turned behind, you can make it sound like it's 20 yards further than what it is and make that bull come just a little bit farther before he thinks he's looking at where the sound came from and starts getting cautious. Okay. And um, so, so even with, with that being said, how are you, how are you like positioning your body and everything? Um, for that shot opportunity. Okay. The, you know, the, you're set up for the, the bulls getting up out of his bed and, you know, he's angry and he's coming in. What, what does that look like? So if you're hunting with a, with a partner, the caller, you know, you've got a straight line basically from the caller to the elk and the elk is typically going to circle downwind to some degree to, you know, basically protect himself as he's moving and smell if there's any danger. So as the shooter setting up out in front of the caller, you don't want to set up, you know, in a position where he's going to, the bull's going to circle around and end up hitting your wind uh, before he even gets to the collar or gets into your shooting lane. So 
you know, I'm usually setting up off of that straight line a bit on the downwind side. And then if I'm hunting by myself, that's, that's sometimes a challenge. If you're calling that elk's coming to the call. And a lot of times all you're presented with is a frontal shot. You know, he might come into 20 yards, but he's usually coming straight to you. Whereas if you have a shooter and a caller, you're able to get the caller on that straight line. So the elk's still coming straight to the caller, but then the shooter can be set off to the side. So that he's getting a broadside shot as the elk passes through. Okay. So if, um, so if the thermals are going up the hill, you're on the same level as the elk, your caller would want to be down a little bit from you. Would that be, am I thinking of that correctly? So if you're, yeah, and you mentioned a really good point there. I try to get on the same level as the elk so that the thermals are actually going perpendicular to us. If I'm set up, you know, straight above the elk, and even if the thermals are coming up, I mean, I've got it, you know, 100% in my favor. If a cloud comes over or if the thermals do switch, which they can do and they can get swirly, but when they switch, it's typically a 180 degree switch. So if I'm directly above that elk and the thermal switch, he's going to smell me and be gone. Whereas if I'm at the same level as him and the thermals are kind of blowing perpendicular to that line between me and the elk, if they switch, he's still not going to smell me. So it just buys me a lot more of an advantage thermal, you know, from the thermals than if I was directly above him or below him. So if we're approaching him from the same level and say the thermals are coming uphill, it's midday. As the shooter, I want to get up above that straight line because if that elk comes in, he's typically probably going to circle up a little bit to get the thermals in his favor. So when he comes across, he's going to be able to smell if that elk that he's hearing is truly an elk or if it's danger. And if I'm set up, you know, at the same level or down below as the shooter, that elk's probably going to smell me before he even gets close to the collar and, and smells the collar and probably before I get a shot since my sense kind of going out at a, you know, let's just imagine a 45 degree funnel or a fan that elk's, or the sense going out and, and dissipating and probably going to smell me before he actually gets right above me into a shooting lane. Okay. All right. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. And like you said, that's, that's a good point of being on the, the same level there in case the cloud cover does, you know, come over and change because that's, that's definitely something that happens. And I, at least in the high country of Colorado, which is where my limited experience is, it, uh, it seemed like every afternoon you'd have a, a storm that came through. So if you're, you know, in a position at that time frame, it, it could definitely change. Absolutely. And the other thing is, you know, at those transition points where the therm the thermals do change, you can have a, a downdraft. So you can have a downward thermal on a north facing slope because that ground's still really cool and it doesn't heat up. It's not subject to the sun nearly as fast as an open exposed south face. And so if you're on a ridge that's running, you know, east west and you've got north face on one side and south face on the other. That south face, the thermals might be coming up at 9 o'clock, but on the north face, the thermals are still going down until 10 or 10.30. And so you've got those competing thermals there that really can cause a lot of swirling winds. Uh, same thing if you're down in the bottom of a draw. One side of that draw might be pulling up. The other side might be coming down. And as the, the north side starts to warm up, it can cause a lot of, of you know, competing swirling winds and make it really hard to get a consistent thermal there. So in those situations, I think it's always best just to back out and let things kind of stabilize a bit before you try to approach it. Because taking a chance on thermals, if you're, if you're pushing the envelope there and being aggressive when it comes to thermals, uh, nine times out of 10, you're probably going to get busted. The elk's going to smell you. And if an elk smells you, that's probably the worst thing that can happen. Yeah. So um, with that being said, our do you, do you do much um, as far as actual hunting and some of these tactics for in first thing in the morning and, you know, towards the end of the day, or are you mostly waiting for those thermals to switch and be consistent while you're, you're making, you know, the moves? No, we're, we're definitely out there before daylight and we're, you know, trying to get on elk right at daylight because that gives us you know, usually a good two, two and a half hours of hunting before the thermals change. And so if we can get on the elk, and, you know, even if we get into their bedding area before the thermals change, uh, obviously we have to be a lot more cautious because we don't want to get 60 yards from them right as the thermals do change and blow everything out. But, yeah, we're definitely hunting 
that first flight, um, same strategy to trying to get close and, and challenge them. I just, I think that if you can get into those bedding areas, I think most people go back to camp midday, you know, 10, 10 30 comes and start to get warm. They go back to camp and make a big lunch and take a nap and hang out there, shoot their bow, fish the streams, whatever it is. And then, uh, you know, four thirty, five o'clock in the afternoon, like, oh, the evening hunts about here and they get out and go again. And you're just hunting transition animals at that point, animals that are mobile and on the move and just makes it a lot more difficult. But we're definitely uh, taking advantage of that and hunting those times as well. But then we don't go back to camp. We just ramp it up during the middle of the day. Yeah. All right. Well, Corey, I know uh, we we just hit about the hour mark here. I know you have to get going here, but uh, <laughs> it goes I fast, doesn't it? Yeah, I was like, geez, I didn't even get into about you know a quarter of the things that I'd love to. But I think that was a you know a really good discussion on just kind of real life situations and and setting up um, on elk. And before before I let you go though, I, I have a question that that I kind of ask all of all of the guests that I have on here. And that is, how do you define adventure? Oh, man, that's a great question. I think, uh, you know, it it goes back, and this might take a little longer than what you're looking for, but when we created Extreme Elk Magazine, that was the focus on the magazine. I think so many hunting publications focus on the kill, you know, and, and the score, and all of these quantitative things that, yeah, they're definitely a part of it. And to be successful and, and kill an elk is absolutely my goal. But it's a brief moment of a seven or eight day hunt. And while it's the ultimate goal, it definitely, I don't think, defines the adventure. So for me, you know, the definition of, of a truly successful hunt um, doesn't come down to just success. I think it comes down to the interactions I have, the camaraderie of the people I'm hunting with. You know, the the hunt I look forward to most every year is the hunt that Dirk and Donnie, my two hunting partners, and I do together. And it's just because that's our time to be in our element doing what we love to do. And, you know, just that that teamwork, the friendship, everything that goes into it. Um, obviously, you know, it's, it's hard to call it an adventure if we're not getting into elk and not employing any of our skills and not getting any closer to our goal of, of being successful. But that adventure, if I, if I was to define adventure, it's the, the pursuit of something that brings great joy and, and excitement to what you're doing. And I can't think of a, of a more exciting and thrilling adventure than chasing elk, especially with a, with a bow and arrow during the rut in the fall. Yeah, man, I uh yeah, I have chills thinking about that and the fact that it's only, you know, for me a month away and maybe even sooner for you. I'm not sure when when you're starting your hunts, but man, it's coming soon. It is. We leave uh 3 weeks from this Friday to uh go to Oregon and hunt Roosevelt elk for the first time over in Oregon. So, again, brand new area, brand new hunt, new species of elk, you know, uh, definitely a learning curve there, but super excited to go over and employ some of the things that I've learned about the area and the animal. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be really cool. Um, but before we, before we go here, Corey, um, like I said, I, I could, uh, talk to you about elk hunting and, and business and a million different things here, but, uh, we'll, we'll be cognizant of your time and, and where can we find some more information on, on what you're doing and what, what you're doing with elk 101 and the university of elk hunting? For sure. Yeah. So we've got, you know, I've got a, a personal Instagram page. It's just Corey Jacobson dot elk 101. And then obviously we have the elk 101 Instagram page, which we're really close to a hundred thousand followers there. So if somebody wanted to go and tip the scale for us and get us there uh, here in the next week or so, I'm pretty confident we'll hit it, but uh, I've got a lot of, a lot of cool content on Instagram. Uh, we've got a YouTube channel for elk 101, a lot of videos and films and different things out there. Uh, and then the website itself is, you know, like, as we mentioned at the beginning, just a great resource and a ton of articles. I think there's, I don't know, 300 and some articles about elk hunting out there. You can go, you know, tons of videos on the website. Uh, it's just elk101.com. And then if someone was interested in the, in the online course, 
Uh, it's the University of El Conte. And if they just go to elk101.com, click on the link for the online course, and there's a really good overview that kind of goes through a lot of the content and explains the course and some of the, the benefits of it. You know, the, like you mentioned, the mobile app. Uh, there's a lot of discounts. If somebody's a member of the online course, they get a 15% discount in the Elk 101 store. So for buying gear, you know, if you're buying a backpack and a set of boots and some clothing, it pretty much pays for the online course right there in the 15% discount. Uh, and then there's a lot of other things. We have a private Facebook group for online course members that you get to get in there and interact with. I think we're over 3,000 members in the in the Facebook group now, and uh, I think we're around 14,000 members in the online course uh, wow. in general. But <laughs> yeah, so a lot of a lot of information there. Uh, and again, if if the online course isn't for somebody completely understand, and there's still a ton of of free content information that would definitely be worth checking out at elk101.com. But if they are interested in the course, I know you and I talked and I created a discount code just before we jumped on the podcast here. And uh, if they if they get in and sign up for the course and use the discount code East West, so just one word East West, uh, it'll save them ten bucks when they get signed up for their uh, annual membership. And that, you know, the annual membership gives you full access for an entire year to the whole thing. It's not like you go through it once and you're done. You can go back and refresh, you know, relearn, go into areas, especially after season. I think it's so important to go through it again and kind of apply what you learned and what you saw to, to what's taught there in the online course. Yeah, especially right after the season, because that's when it's most pertinent in your mind and uh can can think about it but if i could say there's one thing that's really helped me and like and again thank you for you know coming out with this course but it was and, and i'm truthfully saying that it was very helpful for me to help that learning curve that is you know so steep is in elk hunting you know coming from an eastern or, or midwestern perspective so um yeah use use our code uh east west for the University of Elk Hunting and save $10 on the online course there. Totally. A quick question for you, Bo. Yeah. Are you heading out elk hunting this fall? Of course I am. <laughs> yeah, I'm... I'm uh, is your third, third season? Yes, it is. Yes, this is my third season, and this is, this is my season to put an elk on the ground finally, so I... That's it's going to be my year. I can feel it. I can feel it. So, <laughs> and if it doesn't, totally. and no, one of my partners do, I am going to be just as happy and and you know hope for that even more. So, absolutely. No, that's something we didn't even touch on was hunting partners. But yeah, we we approach it as a team. And if you know my hunting partner kills an elk, that's a that's a victory for the team. And when you approach it that way instead of competing with your hunting partners, you know, and when, when you're just as happy for them to kill something as you are, I think it elevates your success even more, not only in terms of making it that much more rewarding, but I truly think that you can be more successful in terms of a success rate uh, when you do hunt together as a team like that and you're concerned for each other's success more than your own. Yeah, no, definitely. And that's, that's the way I look at it. And I'm, I'm extremely excited for this year. I'm not sure how long I'm going out yet. I have some complications with, uh, my job right now to, to figure that out, but it'll at least be a week of hunting potentially longer. And, uh, no matter what it is, you know, make the best of it and, and make it, try to make it happen. But, uh, totally. and, and, and you, you can always just, you can always just quit your job and then you can hunt the whole month. Well, that's kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually Corey, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to be getting laid off at some point and, uh, I'm, it's either going to be the beginning of September or October. So that depends on what time, oh, time I get off. <laughs> so it's not a matter it. of being stuck at work and, and not getting to hunt. It's just, you might get to hunt extra. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I've talked about that on a podcast before, but I'm the only person that would be happy to be laid off during, you know, hunting season, or I guess hunters as a whole are okay with that. And, and I'm a, an environmental and safety engineer. So I, uh, getting out of the office for an extended period of time is awesome. That's right. <laughs> well, good luck on that front. Yeah. Thank you. And, and good luck to your hunts. But one last note, Corey, um, one thing you didn't mention, and again, you, you never do, it seems like on the podcast is you are, was it 10 times world elk calling champion? 
Or is it 11 now? Yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> and yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. But the thing, I, I just, I don't want anyone to think that they have to be a great caller to, to successfully call an elk, because it's not. It's, I was a great caller when I was younger, and I was a terrible elk hunter. So I'd much rather hunt with somebody that, that uh, has the, you know, maybe the, the predator skills and the instinct to be a good hunter and know what to do and when to do it than somebody who's a great caller. So it's certainly not a, a prerequisite to being a successful elk hunter or an elk caller. All right. Yeah. Well, I, again, I wanted to bring that up cause I knew you wouldn't and, uh, it definitely need to be noted and, and, uh, yeah. So Corey, thank you very much. I, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day and, um, you know, have fun going to pick up your daughter here. So I don't want to keep you any longer. Sounds great. Bo, thanks so much for having me on and definitely good luck this season. And I know I'll be hearing from you and looking forward to seeing the pictures of your first bull elk. Yes, of course. And uh, good luck to you here in, in three weeks. We'll talk soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Bo. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.